Hello all. So today we are going to discuss about the International Clinical Trials Day historical perspectives. So when we talk about history, generally we want to take lessons from history so that we can run our car in the future very smoothly. So as we all know, the importance of clinical trials in modern medicine, it is important to recognize few historical moments. And when, when we are talking about the International Clinical Trial Day, which is on 20th of May, this is to commemorate the activity of James Lind, who had started his instrumental experiment on scurvy treatment on the same day. So this day recognizes the significance of clinical trials in advancing medical knowledge and, of course, improving the patient care. When we are talking about clinical trials, which plays a crucial role in the development of new treatments, medications, medical procedures, they are generally carefully designed research studies to evaluate the safety, efficacy, and also potential adverse effects of new interventions or comparing with existing treatments to determine the best course of action. So this World Clinical Trial Day, which we are going to observe today, that it serves as a reminder of the impact that clinical trials have had on medical progress throughout the history. It also aims to raise awareness about the importance of patient participation in the clinical trials. So as volunteers are essential for advancing medical research and improving healthcare outcomes for the future generation, we always consider patient as the central stakeholders or the key stakeholders in this whole ball game. So on that background, we need to discuss about this clinical trial day. And when we are talking about clinical trial day, it is important to note that we all should know about the story of great James Lane. So when we talk about the story of James Lane, it is important to note he was a Scottish physician and he himself had done a marked uh, groundbreaking experiment, we, we must acknowledge, in that 1747. So which is known as one of the earliest controlled clinical trials in the history of medical science. So Lean's experiment aimed to find a cure for scurvy, a disease that plagued sailors on long sea voyages. So during his time in the Royal Navy, Lean noticed that scurvy was a significant problem. And also, he, that, that causes a significant mortality among the sailors. So to find a solution, he conducted a systematic experiment on board that HMS Salisbury. The ship name was HMS Salisbury, which was the first place of uh, so-called clinical trial. So Lynch selected 12 sailors who were suffering from scurvy and divided them into six pairs. Each pair was given a different treatment to test its efficacy and it, they, they tried to find out whether they are efficacious against scurvy. Treatments that Lind included was one arm uh, citrus fruits, one arm vinegar, another is seawater, various level of uh, herbal remedies, another arm, and finally, one arm to 
mixture of garlic, mustard seed, and horseradish. After several days of treatment, the sailors who received citrus fruits, particularly the lemons and oranges, showed significant improvement in their health. This observation led Lean to conclude that citrus fruit were effective remedy to treat salty. And what happened after that 1747, almost 50 years after, British made citrus fruit compulsory in the diet of the sailors. So this was the contribution from the HMS Salisbury by James Lean. And he had written this very important book, which can be uh, recognized as the first report of clinical trial in the history of medical science, that is the treatise of the scurvy. Few important points on this Lean's experiment. First of all, he had selected those subjects who were in similar conditions. Like was compared with like. Nowadays, we know the importance of baseline matching in each clinical trial. When we see the report of any clinical trial, we check that chart where the baseline was matched, the p-value was not significant, and in the two arms or three arms, whatever the study design required. But we can see the Lean's experiment, how they control the variables. But yes, with each experiment, with each clinical research, there, well, there are some confusions. Even in this case, the, uh, the experimenter, that is the Lean, has some uh, confusion. And that is due to, first of all, they initially used fresh fruits, but due to the issue of expense and perishability of the fruit, they prepare some complicated method to prepare an inspicited juice. But when they inspic the inspicited juice was prepared, it was devoid of vitamin C. They don't know about that fact. And that is why the initially they are not getting the same response which was uh, obtained during the Lynn's experiment at HMS Salisbury because that uh, juice was not contained vitamin C. And this is one cause. After 1747, it took almost 50 years to uh, understand why the desired benefit was not there with inspicited juice. And that is why it took 50 years. And then they understood that the importance of fresh fruits. Next, another important issue is that with all uh, experiments, all clinical research, the background studies are very important. They are critical. We need to have a thorough review of literature. There were some previous documentations too. Even the Vasco da Gama in 1498, we Indians know him very well. He had instructed to bring oranges for his sailors. Or even the record Hawkins in 1593, he had also introduced that oranges and lemons among the sailors. So in this particular experiment and the reporting in the Lane Treatise, this was missing. So we now can have a clear understanding that yes, before beginning any clinical research, we should have a proper background knowledge, a proper review of literature. Then with each clinical research, apart from the primary outcome, we always get some secondary outcomes too. In this experiment, in that 18th century, as one arm get some distillated seawater, that distillation of the fresh uh, from the seawater to get a fresh water, that process of distillation, that technology of the distillation 
came up, which was very important that time. And another important issue is that was that the occupational health that they emphasize this specific experiment emphasized the importance of occupational health. So these are few important issues we need to acknowledge from the James Lynch experiment. Now coming to when we talk about history, it is important to know history as a whole. So let's discuss few important points from pre-James Lynch era. We, many of us know this uh, Holly book of Daniel, where we get a story about this King Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar ordered his people to eat only meat and drink only wine. And this diet he believed would keep them in a sound physical condition. But what happened? Several young men from that royal blood who preferred to eat vegetables had, had a strong objection. Now, King allowed these rebels to follow a diet of legumes and water for 10 days. What happened after 10 days? He had seen, he had observed that vegetarians appeared better nourished than the meat eaters. Now, this result make the king uh, to give the permission, the king ultimately permitted those legume lovers to continue their diet. So, this is one type of open, uncontrolled human experiment. But this experiment had guided a decision about the public health, which we need to understand. And that is why this event was quite historical. And now we all know, for last 10 years or 20 years, Lots of studies are ongoing and they had shown a vegetarian diet or vegan diet which had produced better effect compared to the other arms. So what had initiated that time in the timing of King Nebuchadnezzar, now the studies are proving the concept. Another important history is like that, the Avicenna, the canon of medicine. And this canon of medicine is very important. Why? Few important principles were written there. Study be made of the time of action and reproducibility of the effects of the drugs. So this was the first concept given in that book. But yes, there were no record of having a applied of the uh, application of these principles in the practice. But importantly, it was mentioned a remedy should be used in its natural state in disease without complications. So this was the first time again a very important message we got a treatment should be tested in a controlled environment to reduce confounding factors and here we need to exclude patients with complex comorbidities so this is what we always do now to increase the internal validity of our clinical research now coming to another experiment of Ambroise Paré in 1537. So there were some conventional treatment by which this doctor also treating the wounded soldiers, burning uh, those wounded areas. But what happened with some specific oils? One day, the oil was not adequate to treat all the wounded. So he had uh, to do something. So for that, that reason, 
there he had prepared some unconventional treatment place of a uh, play, play, just placing a digestive which is made of yolks of eggs oil of roses and turpentine what he had uh, observed that unconventional treatment on those soldiers slept well they had little pain and they, most importantly, their wound was not inflamed or swollen compared to the other arm, the conventional treatment arm. And this observation had changed his entire practice. So he was the responsible for the treatment of the battle wound, uh, battlefield wounded soldiers. And we can see this fast in a clinical trial or fast this type of fast clinical research of the novel therapy which was conducted accidentally. And it was written in his book, never again to burn thus so cruelly the poor wounded by arquebuses. So he was relieved and this statement was uh, came out of his relief. Now coming to post Gippsland era. The first thing which is very important to note is that in the 1800, there were the arrival of the Cebu. We, we, uh, the, the, there was a terminology placebo, which was uh, written like that. It takes the place of the actual substances and it is bogus. So placebo. So 1863, the US physician Austin Flint planned the first clinical study comparing a dummy remedy to an active treatment. And this was given regularly and became well known in my words as the placeboic remedy for rheumatism. So this is the quote from the Austin Plains literature. And in 1886, he had described the study in his book, that is the a treatise on the principle and practice of medicine. Few years back, in 1811 also, this terminology enters into the very uh, noted medical dic dictionary, that is Hooper's Medical Dictionary. In Hooper's Medical Dictionary, it was defined as an epithet given to any medicine more to please than benefit the patient. Now coming to Patulin, there was a huge cry in the newspapers and now we all know why this newspaper or media news regarding the uh, any trial can cause a havoc in the society, specifically while dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, the drugs, the vaccine, which had caused lots of rumors in the uh, newspapers and for that there were increased sale of many drugs and same thing happened with this penicillium patulinum the patulin the extraction named as patulin so there were some discussion on chemical and biological properties in lancet so without understanding everything they the newspaper the popular newspaper came up with this type of news new cure for colds. They had mentioned it is more valuable than penicillin. They also mentioned that was the war time. So will it make our servicemen fight better? So to answer the question on the patulin, the first time we had in history the double blind placebo control trial, patulin for common cold. So we can see how the they had done that blinding, double blinding. And ultimately, they had effectively allocated the patients by random allocation of patulin or control solution to the participants. And it was found that the patulin was not beneficial in common cold. We know this great man and similarly, we need to acknowledge 
his contribution on MRC trial that is on streptomycin to treat pulmonary tuberculosis. So the Sir Bradford Hill, they, he had been anxious that physicians would be unwilling to give up the doctrine of anecdotal experience. So he was a great statistician. So he had prepared, thought about the design and ultimately there were some systematic enrollment criteria and data collection method was evolved under this MRC streptomycin in tuberculosis trial committee, which was formed in 1946 and obviously headed by Sir Bradford Hill, where he had used this allocation concealment method. We all know this is the technique which used to prevent selection bias by concealing the allocation sequences from those assigning participants to the intervention groups until the moment of assignment. So when we talk about this particular trial, another important issue was there. Apart from the subjective measures, this was the first time when they have some objective outcome. So interpretation of excess by experts who were also blinded to the patient's treatment assignments. So this is very important issue. And also there were lots of discussion on the ethics because some amount of streptomycin was already available from US and it was used for the treatment of the tuberculosis and it was found to be a part of the standard of care. So how streptomycin can be, uh, this trial can be on uh, going on without uh, providing in a group of tuberculosis patient this streptomycin where it is already available. But as the amount of streptomycin available from US was limited and that was restricted, so that was the reason, the ethic, ethical reasons by which they can convince the, uh, the their eth ethical committees. So most importantly, the, this streptomycin trial, why it is important? Because of that allocation concealment method, it prevents researcher from unconsciously or otherwise influencing which participants are assigned to the invention, intervention or control group. So that is most important. And that was the concept of that was the concept of uh, allocation concealment. Now, if we talk about evolution of ethical framework, it is important to acknowledge that when we have different atrocities, so the history of research ethics has evolved significantly over the time with several key events and studies shaping its development. And here we can see a brief overview in this particular slide, starting from the Nazi war crimes and progressing to the Kefauver Harris Amendment. So we all know during the World War II, if we can see my slides, uh, yeah. So you can we can see here, the, after the World War II, the Nazi doctors conducted unethical experiments on the prisoners. So what they had done, they had done just abuse to the human. So they had exposed those prisoners to extreme of temperature to see the physiological changes happen in their system. Again, if we just consider about the Jewish chronic disease model. So where in that particular hospital, what they had done, they had injected a cancer cells in the, in the patient, not patients, the healthy volunteer to see how the healthy volunteers tissue rejecting the cancer cells. 
So without any permission, without any consent, this type of inhuman activities had been done. And also this Tusky syphilis trial. Starting from 1932 till it was going on up to 1972 in the field of America. So this trial involved African-American men who were denied the treatment of syphilis. The study continued even after an effective treatment became available because we all know the penicillin the, already came into the market and they just want to see the natural course of syphilis. So this led to severe harm, violation of ethical principles. There is no informed consent and we all know the very principle of beneficients were not there. There were presence of maleficients. They are harming the research participants. Now coming to the Willowbrook study. This is the, again, the notorious school, the Willowbrook school, which had conducted in 1950s, involved intentionally infecting intellectually disabled children with hepatitis A to study the natural history of disease. So again, this study sparked ethical debates about informed consent, vulnerability, and the balance between benefits and risk to the participants. This is important, the Milgram study. Why this Milgram study is important? Because this experiment was done to see the obedience to authority. And participants were led to believe they were administering electric shocks to another person. And that raised the ethical concerns about psychological harm and the potential lack of fully informed consent. And finally, we all should be remember this disaster, this poor girl who, who is a very sweet girl but there is no hands, no upper limbs. The lower limbs were not properly developed. The thalidomide disaster. We know in the late 1950s and early 1960s, the drug thalidomide was prescribed to pregnant women, but led to severe birth defects. And this tragedy highlighted the importance of stringent safety testing and the need for more robust regulations in drug development. What happened in US? Here we need to acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Frances Kelsey. This lady was a pharmacologist who had working in the US FDA in the early 1960s when she was assigned to review the new drug application for thalidomide which was making uh, already marketed in Europe as a sedative and anti-nausea medication, he, she had, Dr. Kelsey had concern about the lack of comprehensive safety data provided by the drugs manufacturer. And Dr. Kelsey refused to authorize its approval despite pressure from the pharmaceutical company she persisted in demanding further evidence regarding the drug safety, particularly its potential to cause birth defects. And Dr. Kelsey's caution proved to be crucial as reports began emerging from the Euro about this alarming increase in severe birth defects among the babies whose mother had taken thalidomide during the their pregnancy. And this drug was found to cause significant limb abnormalities and other development issues. So her dedication to rigorous safety standards and her refusal actually sorry so, so her uh, this dedication and refusal to rush the approval process 
prevented thalidomide from being widely prescribed in the United States. Her actions not only protect American citizens from the devastating effects of the drug, but also led to reforms the drug regulation and the strengthening of FDA's authority to ensure drug safety. And that is why Dr. Francis Kelsley was awarded the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service by President John F. Kennedy in 1962. And after this effect, we had a Favor Harris Amendment we'll discuss. And that is due to this response to thalidomide disaster. But we need to also acknowledge contribution of this great physician, William McBride, who had reported for the first time this type of abnormalities among the children. And he had first time relate thalidomide intake and phocomalia. So we also need to acknowledge this great man. So we know after the Nazi crime, we had Nuremberg Court in 1947. And this had clearly mentioned about the essentiality of the voluntariness of consent. Declaration of Helsinki in the 1964, it actually guided us about the general principles and specific guidelines on use of uh, any research product on the human subjects. The Belmont 90 reports 1979, you emphasize on three important principles. Number one, the uh, uh, respect for the person. Number two, the beneficence. Number three is the justice. So subjects should be even uh, selected fairly to ensure that the benefits and burdens of the medical research are evenly distributed. And we need to maximize possible benefits with minimize the possible harm. So there should not be any maleficence. Our primary target is the beneficence. And we need to respect our research participants, their autonomy. And when there is some, we are dealing with some vulnerable population, they require some special protection, like prisoners, like children, like school uh, ch uh, students, because they have some diminished autonomy. Now coming to this, 1964, 1962, Kefauver Harris Amendment, which had strengthened the federal oversight of drug testing, and that included the requirement for informed consent. So these are important points on ethical principles and how they, there is evolution that happened in these ethical principles. So. When we are talking about, sorry, there is just for a moment. So there is some difficulty, okay. So I think, yeah. So when we talk about the GCP, the evolution of the GCP, the good clinical practice, we need to understand. And when we talk about good clinical practice, we need to know this is the product of both the quality data and ethics. So what is quality data? The data and the reported results are credible and accurate. And what is ethics? 
that is the rights, integrity, and confidentiality of the trial subjects. That should be protected. And when we talk about the ethics, another important thing issue is that ethics is equal to the multiplied product of morality and materialism. If there is no science, no materialism in a clinical research, but that is a highly moral research, ultimately the product will be a zero. And when we talk about a highly moral, uh, highly uh, materialistic, a highly scientific research, but without any morality, then also the end result, the ethics is equal to zero. So we need to understand this important concept. So 1990s, which is the decade of harmonization. And when we talk about harmonization, then it is important to talk about the conference that had been taken place in Belgium, the Brussels International Conference on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, where the primary participants were USA, European Union and Japan. Also, there were regulatory and industry representatives. Canada, Australia, and Nordic countries had uh, participated as observers. WHO acts as a facilitator. And from that conference, we got four ICH topics, the broad heading, the quality, safety, efficacy, and multidisciplinary. And among that efficacy part, the E6 version is the good clinical practice guideline that we need to understand. So already we talk about the ethics because without ethics, clinical research is a big zero. We need to understand the ethics. Now, we also need to talk about our own country, India, the history. And we know about the Maharshi Charak, who, is, who was the author of the great Charak Samhita, and also the Maharshi Susruta, the founding father of surgery, and also the writer of Susruta Samhita. So they, in their literature, long, long back, they had mentioned the importance of evidence-based medicine. They had given emphasis on the clinical expertise, the evidences available among their the physicians, and also the patient's experience, patient satisfaction level. And also, they had given emphasize on documenting the results of their treatment. And that is why the Ayurveda, the Charak Samhita, they were some, or even the literature by Maharshi Susrut was most important. And when we talk about ethics, we all know India is the mother of ethics. And this is the beautiful sloka from Upanishad. Atmana pratikulani pareshuna samacharit. That means do unto others what you would like others to do unto you. So this is the basic principle if we follow as a clinical researcher. When we are sitting in the chair of clinical researcher and the research participant is sitting in front of my table and that is uh, his chair, if we just consider an exchange of my seat. As a clinical researcher, we need to sit in the chair of the research participants. And from that angle, we need to understand whether the same research can be acceptable by me as a research participants. So if the answer is yes, so that is the more, most critical answer that can help us, yes, to, to, or that can guide us to go forward with the clinical research. But if the answer is no, as a clinical researcher, if I am sitting in that chair, chair of the uh, research participants and uh, the, my answer is no, I cannot participate in this clinical research then I think 
we need to stop doing that particular clinical research and that is why this shloka is important atmana pratikulani pareshuna samacharin so there are few important key documents in the history of clinical research specifically guiding the ethics in india starting from the uh, drugs and cosmetics act in 1940 to Drugs and Cosmetic Rule in 1945. After that, the Schedule Y Amendment in 2005. We had our good clinical practice guideline in 2001 by CDSCO. And also important to acknowledge the ethical guideline of the ICMR in 2000 and which had a revision in 2006. We were so advanced, we can see the guidelines for stem cell research and therapy. ICMR developed that in 2007 and which had a revision in 2013. And finally, we have a new guideline, modified guide, guideline too, which is a very international standard. That is the National Guidelines on Stem Cell Research 2017. And we, we all know our regulator that is CDSO is there to regulate us, regulate the clinical trials. And we have ICMR guidelines, which can help us to do all clinical researches. I think this is a very proud moment for us to the clinical researchers in India, that for last 10 years, the trend of these clinical trials, this was from, a, we, can, we can see the references here too. India has accounted for an 8.3% share of the global clinical trials activity in 2020. So, which was in 2011, 5.5%. Now, 2020, it becomes 8.3%. And interestingly, the into 2019, it was almost 11%. Maybe due to the COVID pandemic, this goes down a little bit. But this upward trend is quite promising for us. And I think these two are the landmark steps which had caused this steep rise of clinical trials in Indian context. One is New Drug Clinical Trial Rule 2019 and another is National Ethical Guidelines for Biomedical and Health Research Involving Human Participants to 2017. So ICMR guideline and the rules. And we all know the rules, the NDCTR rule has having some amendments and ch changes, revisions, we, we are getting day by day. So to have a brief overview on different types of clinical research, if I am as an investigator assigning the exposures, I am decide, deciding which arm will uh, get which type of treatment, if it is yes, then that is an experimental study. If it is not, if I am as an investigator not assigning the exposures, so that is an observational study. If that, that is a comparison group, we can say that is that will be an analytical study. If no comparison group, that could be a descriptive study. Again, when we are talking about analytical study, the direction is important. If I am going from exposure, to outcome. So that is the cohort study from outcome going back to the exposure. That is the case control study. And when the exposure and outcome at the same time, we are capturing a snapshot. That is a snapshot study. That type of snapshot study is the cross-sectional study. And when we are talking about experimental study, if there is random allocation, if it is yes, then that is a randomized control trial. If it is not, that is a non-randomized control trial. So when we are having a clinical trial, that is an experimental study, there is no chance to having something retrospective. So many times we, we see proposals written like that, prospective clinical trial. So all clinical trials are prospective. Retrospective clinical trial, is it possible? Never. Clinical trial cannot be 
a retrospective one because that is an experimental study. So we need to use this terminology uh, very cautiously. And generally, for observational study, we have guideline. We have help from this ICMR 2017 guidelines. Details we need to read. And for clinical trials, we had this document, New Drug Clinical Trial Rule 2019. This is the regulations we should follow when we are doing a, an experimental study. And obviously, we'll get help from the ICMR 2017 guideline too in our experimental study. So these two documents are important for these two type of studies. And that is also very important in Indian context. And finally, when we talk about clinical trial day this year, there is one concept of decentralization of the clinical trial. So centralized clinical trial to decentralized con clinical trial. But generally, the experts are saying we need to balance between two. We need to be in, uh, the, in the middle. Even when we talk about clinical trial, one thing is very important. That is clinical equipoise or therapeutic equipoise. When we are starting our any clinical research, it could be two arm, three arm, four arm. But we should not have any prior uh, thinking that this arm will, will be doing better and this arm will not do, be doing bet, better. So most importantly, when we are starting any clinical trial, we need to be in an equipoise state. And I think to describe that equipoise state, our Lord Krishna had long back think this sloka, Yogastha Kuru Karmani, Swangvantoktva Dhananjaya, Siddho Asiddho Samo Bhuttva, Samattang Yoga Ujjade. So when we are doing clinical trial, when do we are having this clinic, any uh, clinical research, we need to be in a balanced state. And that education, how we can maintain this balanced state, that was taught long, long back in India. And that is what I just want to share with you all in the last slide. Thank you for watching. If you have any comment, any question, you can uh, let us know. And you can type in the chat box in the comment section where we can uh, we can further discuss those comments, those questions. Also welcoming all the critically comments. If you have any critical comments in um, on this presentation, you are most welcome. Thank you.